Good morning, church. I'm secretly grateful that that was it on Father Abraham. Um, I joked on my New Year's resolution last week that I was going to go to the gym once. And now I know why. After the, I'm sore. <laughs> After going to the gym once this week, I'm, I'm still sore. I went on Thursday. My body still hates me. So Father Abraham, oh, it's hard right now and difficult to do. I pray that last week that as you listen to that message and as you made New Year's resolutions, and I'm going to say this very, uh, um, I want you to know this. I want you to know this with all of your heart because it's what Jesus told us. It's what the Bible says. If you are resolved to follow Jesus, There's no turning back because if you're a follower of Jesus, you are saved now. You are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven as you follow him. So I just want to encourage you all that. And then your New Year's resolution, I pray that you made a resolution like that where you know you're going to be able to keep it and be able to accomplish it. Instead of cheating like I do, and now I guess I fulfilled my New Year's resolution. Some of you told me, I can just go to the gym and just touch the door. That means I was there. No, I decided I needed to go in and uh, I'll do my best to keep on going. If you're visiting with us today, welcome. We're glad to have you here with us. I am very thankful to preach here at Rockadine Road Church of Christ because we are a church, and Denny was uh, really instrumental in doing this, where we are a church where we're comfortable with dealing with a theme for a big period of time for the fullness of the year. And last year's theme I really enjoyed, so thank you all for participating with that theme of looking at light fellowshipping in the truth together, all together in that, because it was just a really neat theme. Like I, like we looked at last year, light is all throughout scripture. And it's amazing that God meets us and illuminates the truth in our world, the truth that Jesus is Lord. God is good. And all the time. Amen. That's what we're going to be dealing with this year is that truth that God is good all the time. We're called into a life of worship. We're called to follow him and to serve him as we are disciples of Jesus, to be his people continuously, not just on Sunday morning, but all throughout the week. And that blessing of what it means to follow him as his students, as his apprentices, as his disciples. And so I pray that this year, the theme of life of worship is a blessing to you, is an encouragement to you of recognizing the truth that all throughout the week in the hard times and in the good times that God is good and he's there with you and he's got you. He sent his son for you to be able to save you. And therefore, you should be able to have a life of worship and follow that truth. And the book of Romans, if you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 12. The book of Romans is a fantastic book by Paul where he's writing a letter to a church that has been meeting in several homes in the city of Rome, in a city where idol worship is rampant, where self-worship is what everybody is about. It's about leisurely lifestyles and making sure that you're taken care of and bread and entertainment is thrown down at you. And it's just, it's a place that's got to be difficult to worship God. Kind of like us today. And in that book, Paul reminds the church so profoundly and so wonderfully that we are saved in Christ alone. That there is no other way to salvation except in Jesus. He says in Romans 3.23, very, very profoundly, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But thanks be to God through whom in Christ Jesus he has saved us through his glorious riches and his graces. And so he goes through and talks all throughout his book about how amazing this truth is of Jesus. The fact that we can know that we've died to our sins, that we're a new creations, that we've come to this newness of life, that we can be resolved to know that there is a better way and that we can worship always. And when he gets into chapters 12 through 16, he says, all right, I've talked about Jesus and I've talked about the history of you needing him and the truth of you needing him. Here's what you do as a result of that. So I'm going to be reading from Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Oftentimes, uh, people, when they go through studies of uh, Romans, they talk about this term of the Romans road or the the Romans uh, um, road to salvation. And one of the things that um, I like about that terminology is a life of worship is really a journey. It's a continuous process of being in right relationship with God. And I know because of the way the terminology, we, the church language that we use, that when we use the word worship, especially in relation to like service, we often put worship service together and it makes it sound like it's this one hour event throughout the week where we all come together on Sunday mornings and sing. And that's what our act of worship is. But Paul, in his 
revelation of the truth that God is good all the time and that he sent his one and only son for us says this about worship in verse number one of chapter 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Now, there's something about that sentence there that is very profound and wonderful, complex and simple and just one, just amazing all at the same time. And I know it's a little bit hard to read on the screen because of the different fonts that are up there, but I chose this on purpose so that you can notice what's going on there. Look at this. Paul says, because Jesus is so wonderful, he is our savior and you can know that you're saved in him. He says, therefore, here's what you do. I appeal to you. Brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do you notice the, the singular and plural change in there? Those of you that are uh, language teachers, did you notice that? That really like reading and look at it? Present your bodies, plurally, right? As living sacrifices, or hold on, I said that wrong, didn't I? Do you catch where your mind wanted to go as you're reading that verse and what he actually said? He said, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, there's the plural, to present your bodies, there's another plural, as a living sacrifice. When we think about a life of worship, when we think about what it means to come together to be in church and fellowship and then to go into our lives throughout the week, we've got to be honest and cognizant about the fact that we all live different lives, do very different things, and Jesus is with us together in all of that. Sometimes we find it hard to think about a life of worship outside of the church walls because we find it hard to realize that even though we're apart, we're still the body of Christ that we present our bodies individually as a living sacrifice. Paul in 1 Corinthians talks about the truth that we shouldn't uh, be using our bodies in a wrong way because he says, do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the, level of the Holy Spirit? And so he calls us to watch out for that. And when you read on later on and he uses that phrase again, he means it for the whole entire church. A life of worship is about living together in our individual lives, knowing that relationship with God is all the time. That he's good and he's always there for us in the midst of all the good things that happen to us, the great meals that we get to eat, the way we wake up in the morning, the beautiful sunrises and sunsets we get to get to look at the, well, I guess trees aren't that beautiful right now, but they will be in a couple of months, to look at the beauty of his nature and his creation and to give glory to God. But also... When we wake up in the morning and our bodies are hurting or a virus has hit us and we're not feeling so well that day or there's relationship issues going on in the home, there's a struggle and strife. And what, God, what Paul says there is he says, daily present yourselves because you are the church. You are a living sacrifice. Jesus died for you and gave his life for you. So he encourages us in that. And then he continues on and says this, do not be conformed to this world. But, by, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. What he doesn't say there is, all right, guys, only on Sunday mornings, when you get together to commune, sing, pray, listen to Thai, and do all that other stuff that you do on Sunday morning. Drive and go back home, have a meal, either at home or at the restaurant. He doesn't say only on Sundays. He says, no, constantly be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. He's saying in everything you do in work or deed, do all as if doing, doing work for the Lord, giving glory to God. And so this theme of life of worship is going to challenge us, but it's going to encourage us in our daily lives. It's going to call us out to the, us out to the truth that when we go to the bank or we go to Walmart, when we're driving around, when we're at school, when we're learning, when we're at home, whatever it is, when we work or play, that God is good and he is with us. And we can have right relationship with him always. And so Paul calls us out to that in the book of Romans. And he says, because Jesus is so amazing, 
Here's the life that you are blessed to be able to live. It's a life of worship, offering up your bodies daily as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And brothers and sisters, I want to make sure that we catch this. He's not saying, if you don't do this perfectly, you're going to fail and you'll never be able to do it. He doesn't say that at all. What he says is because Jesus is perfect, you are able to do this. So as we talked about in our adult Bible study here in the auditorium earlier this morning, don't let Satan, don't let the accuser get in the way of recognizing the truth that you have a life of worship. And one of the things I really want to encourage us that came up in class this morning is this. Even when you are doing a task and you're not thinking about the Lord, the Lord is there and that you're in relationship with him. We talked about that and about that being a little bit of a struggle for some of us. And the truth is that we're called to a life of worship to where the, the testing of us may discern what the will of God is. So I look forward to studying this with you all this year because I think it's going to bless us. And we're going to do many events and many different things this year in order to help look out for this and bless. And I'll, I'll share a few of those here at the end of the sermon. But turn with me to Matthew chapter 28. I want to show you something here. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20 are going to be the verses that we key in on this year as we look at life of worship. And I know, and I'm, we're going to see it in the first two verses here, I know that this is about the 11 apostles that are there with Jesus at that time. And it's possible that other disciples are there with them at that time, but what we're letting know about here is that it, it seems it's about the 11 because of what happens on the day of Pentecost. I know it's about that. But notice what they're taught and notice how it blesses our lives and leads into and the, the joy that we're going to have and looking at what it means to have a life of worship. This is the end of Matthew, the, Matthew's gospel, good news about Jesus. He says this. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples in all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We're going to get into that really deeply all throughout this year, looking at the truth that we're called to be disciples of Jesus. And disciples are people that make disciples and what that means. We're also going to look at the truth that that word disciple is a word that's a bit hard to understand in our culture today in this day and time. We had a meeting about three or four months ago where we looked at that word as opposed to the word Christian. And uh, there was a lot of... Uh, um, Differences of opinion of what disciple and Christian meant as if they were different things. We're going to talk about that this year and celebrate the truth that we're called to a life of worship of being disciples of Jesus. And what that means to be a disciple doesn't mean that means that we're all supposed to be exactly the same. What it means is that we're all to follow the same Savior. One more time. I said at the beginning of this about our New Year's resolution, and I'll say it again. If you are in Jesus, you are saved. You are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And as we follow him, we follow. We offer up our bodies daily as a living sacrifice. We follow together the same savior. And he is good and with us all of the time. And so that challenge is going to be for us as a church, as a family of Christ, as a body, as a temple of God, to be together in this and to go through that. So we're going to do some things throughout this year that are going to help bless us in that. And here's the first challenge you guys have this year. And it will become a little bit easier. We'll send out emails on this challenge, and this is going to be a continuous challenge for the year. And like I said um, about our New Year's resolutions, if you mess up, that doesn't mean you should stop. It just means you should start off where you left off. It's going to be this. I want to challenge us as a body of Christ, as individuals who are family together, to read through, prayerfully read through the Psalms this year. The Psalms are a beautiful collection of prayers from different uh, individuals who are following God in their everyday lives, in their everyday needs. It's not just about a once, one hour a week thing. It's about their whole entire life. 
And the challenge is this. Some of the Psalms, as you prayerfully read through it, um, you're probably going to read some things and not be able to connect. Like David's warrior Psalms. Some of us in here have had to go to battle. A lot of us haven't. When David talks about enemies coming at him, trying to ensnare him and trap him with weapons and stuff like that, some of us are going to be like, yeah, I don't really get that. But you can still pray through it. And so the challenge is this. There's 150 Psalms. There are 52 weeks of the, 52 weeks of the year. I am dyslexic with time. So if I say like 52 months or something like that, you just have to know what I meant by context. But anyways, there's 52 weeks out of the year with the 150 Psalms. Psalm 119 is really long. So we've already missed a week. We're on day seven. We're going to start this week, and we're going to let Psalm 119 be one of them. If I did my math right, that should put us to a fullness of the week. The challenge for this week is this. Read Psalms 1 through 3, chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3, and prayerfully join the psalmist in what they say as they live a life of worship. Notice those things that the psalmist does. We're going to have an app that comes out. I'm hoping that the app is able to do a, um, a reading plan that will help us join. If it's not, we'll still make sure to get the communication out each and every week of what psalms that we're in the midst of. But take some time, either as individuals or with your family, and read through the psalms. Another thing that we're doing this year is we're starting life groups. We're starting these uh, groups that we're going to study of what it means to be a disciple together and spend that time. And well, at the end of Romans, in Romans chapter 16, verse 5, it's, um, he's talking about Prisca and Aquila. And he says, greet the church that meets in their house. It's a good thing for us to spend time together in fellowship in small groups that we can share life together and Offer our bodies up daily as living sacrifices, as a living sacrifice. And so we're going to practice that. And Denny is also going to be meeting here in the buildings on uh, Sunday evenings, I believe at 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock, Denny will be here, and they're going to be going over the book of Romans to look at the truth of what um, Paul tells the church there in Rome, of what it means to follow Jesus as a life of worship. And so there's going to be a lot going on. We're going to have even more events as we go throughout the year that will help us to practice this and bless us in it. But brothers and sisters, I so look forward to 2024, the rest of this year. And if Jesus comes, I look forward to that as well. But until he comes, this is going to be a fantastic year of celebrating the truth that we are called to more than just one hour a week as disciples of Jesus. We are called to a life of worship, a life full of purpose and meaning that hopefully has joy even in the midst of the hard times. Because Jesus is Lord. He is our Savior. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you're a citizen of the kingdom of heaven now. You are already saved. And so, as I conclude, I pray that the Lord keeps you and blesses you. I pray the Lord turns his face to you and is gracious to you. And I pray that the Lord lifts his face to you and gives you his peace. If you're not a follower of Jesus and you're wondering about what that means and how to become a follower of Jesus, come talk to me. Or if you're ready to be baptized and follow him because you believe in him, come forward when we stand and sing in just a moment. And if you need prayer for anything, for anything, let us be a people that share a life of worship together. There are so many different ways we can pray together. You can share it through the push, the pray until something happens email messages, or you could come forward and share it all together. It doesn't matter. May we be a people that share a life of worship together as we go about our daily lives, knowing that God is good all the time and he is always with us. Let us stand and sing.